Anyways, uh, where I kind of want to uh, frame things is now that we're sort of over the break, where we're kind of going with this is we're, we're leading into our machine learning section. We are not there yet. We are going to start building towards it because, you know, all that foundation that we did with logic, in essence, it leads to this lecture. This is the creme de la creme. This is, if you can implement this, you are, you are superior to every tech company out there, is how I want you to frame it. This is what we're all, this is what we're chasing right now. This is like the, the brass ring, right? If you can get an agent to start to develop a plan and be able to execute that plan, right? Why don't we have robot butlers yet? Yes, I know we've all seen the Google robot butler. If you have not, uh, I'll just, even before we frame this, right? So, there, right? Two-minute paper is also great. Uh, if you have not seen sort of this thing yet, where, yeah, where it's able to kind of identify and move through in all this whole process here, right? This is modern work right now. Look at that. That's from two years ago type of stuff. It is, it is what we are currently trying to figure out. If you can get this tech going on, then you're, again, you're, you're at the forefront of what we consider AI in present day. Now, this is where we had to kind of build, right? We had to do with all the pathfinding and the searching and the thinking uh, and like the whole graph traversal. And then we had to even think about knowledge representation, right? And how to develop out these logical statements because we got to remember that it's AI, it's not a human. So like it has to kind of build out something that can be condensed into true false statements, right? So... That's where I want you to kind of come in with today. This is, I can't give you like a specific algorithm, uh, mostly because if we had one, like one that, you know, I could give you, I would, but we don't, you know, like the best I got is, you know, something called a graph plan. And when I show that to you, your brains will explode. I can't wait. But the way I want you to kind of frame that, just keep that in the back of your mind is like, this is, right, this is where we're all pushing right now with, uh, the latest push and rise of AI. Uh, and so what we're looking at specifically is we shift sort of our discussion. We've talked about problem-solving agents, optimization agents. We were talking about logical agents beforehand, but really that was just us playing logic and then also being like, oh, well, you know, when we try and solve these things, here's what we do to solve them. Now we're essentially taking our agent and saying, what if that's its purpose? What if its purpose is to devise up a plan? And, well, in that case, yeah, it's very similar to everything we've done so far, right? Build out those plans, figure out how to get from one place to another, do the thing. But the problem becomes, how does it do that? How does it work through all of those processes and decide those goals, right? Constructing those plans to make those goals. That's where things start to shift, right? You had a star, go to one thing. But what if I started to tell you to go to multiple things or those things weren't just go to location but also do a thing kind of approaches, right? That's where it gets a little bit more difficult. And why this kind of presenting is, well, again, think about what we did in the logic section. Think about what we talked about inside of knowledge representation, right? We mentioned it was hard, right? I asked y'all to try and represent your own little things, and it was hard. And I, I was like, uh, y'all need a little work on it, right? That's, yeah, it, it is incredibly difficult to do. You're all starting, you know, who here has yet to start problem set four? Don't admit that, right? It's due Monday. Don't, don't we... <laughs> My point being, one of the things that we're asking you to do, right, if you think about Connect 4, there is no, like, 
heuristic to say whether or not something's good or bad. I showed you a bunch of heuristics uh, like throughout the semester, but like, yeah. Yeah. So for those of you who waited, enjoy your weekend. That was not a smart move. Uh, but here's where, okay, fine, fine, all right, you know. I want to present something from my past. I heard a yes. Uh, Merlin, this is Chip. Please say hi to Chip. Now, the reason why I present this is Chip is from my childhood. You see, once upon a time, I was not allowed on the Internet. <gasps> I know. Why? Because Internet was dial-up. It wasn't instantaneous. It wasn't I just have, like, streaming services all running at all times, right? My mom needed to use the phone. I couldn't be on the computer. Well, I couldn't be on the internet. So we had a bunch of games on the computer. One in particular was the game Chips Challenge. And this is where you get to see a little bit of my life as well. Bummer. And that's the, it's not the only song, but that's, it just repeated. So it, it, that, that's an earworm that just lives in here for the rest of my life. Uh, if you're super uh, interested, it is free to play. Uh, so you, you're more than welcome to just have it. No, I don't want a notification. Um, the entire idea to this, though, specifically is, this is what we call a, a, a Sokoban style game uh, or just a tile-based puzzle game. These were, are still kind of very popular. I think uh, Baba is You or something like that. Uh, that's one of the, the current games that like are also in this kind of light where it's, oh, you have to move your character to different locations specifically to obtain uh, different kinds of uh, statuses. So in this case, well, let me just actually just go back to the slides, right? So in this type of situation, for example, right, you have, this is level one. Uh, you've got chip just floating out in space. Again, you would be, as, as a game player, you'd be controlling it with your, your uh, arrow keys on your keyboard. But specifically, the goal for this game is you need to collect every single one of those microchips. Reason why is because once you get every single one of those microchips, you get to unlock that little brown square, because I'm way too lazy to have tried to rebuild all of that, right? And why is, well, the goal, right, the goal condition, if you treat it like this, is that you need to get to the portal. Okay, well, if you notice, to get those microchips, some of them are behind doors. A yellow key is needed to get this microchip, because to get that microchip, you have to unlock the yellow door with the yellow key. And if you were to play the guessing game, well, oh, hey, there's the yellow key. There's a microchip also there, but oh, no, to get that yellow key, I got to go through a blue door, which means I got to get a blue key. And so if you look at each one of these steps, notice it's not just this idea of, oh, I need to, you know, move to a location, but there is sort of logic being applied as well, right? As I view the fact that I need this microchip, I need, oh, to traverse some doorway. And so now it's a question, does my agent, does Chip have a yellow key? If yes, if true, right, then you can walk through the door. Otherwise, the environment's not going to let you. So again, the issue here, or at least the task at hand, right, is we can start to think about it in, well, here's my starting condition. And if we assumed it was a completely observed environment, right, well, where do I go? Right? What's the first step I do? Because it's a little bit different than when you were dealing with, like, your A star, because your goal condition, right, the, the goal has many subconditions that need to happen. So where do I go first, right? What's that first step? And even then, as we start to kind of build that out, the big issue is, if you notice, 
it's a giant branching factor. The same kind of problem that we were seeing with like a star search is still happening here, right? Oh, as I go from like, oh, let me go get that blue key. Well, now what do I do? Like think about all the different things that I need to be reviewing, right? There are tangible items that need to get picked up. Many of them, yes, I do in fact need to pick up to solve, excuse me, this entire puzzle. So which one do I do next? And you can see it just starts to expand into these, this giant, giant branching factor. Again, like everything, it will get me there, right? It, it, if I brute force this, I can potentially find a solution, right? As long as, um, you know, I don't have worries of like infinite loops or cyclical motions. And again, that's where you gotta like have some sort of plan uh, to handle that, um, right? That makes it very difficult. So can we make something that's a little bit more rational, right? A little more intelligent, if you will, than just the brute force approach to this problem. And so that's where, again, when we start to think about it, it's this kind of weird spot, right? Everything I give you is my attempt to kind of contain it, give it to you as a toy exercise so that you, oh, I get the gists of it. And then hopefully if you ever need to actually use something like ant colony optimization, whatever library you end up using, right? It's not the end of the world because you understand like what's going on behind it. And specifically though, that's where what we look at is can we try and make it a relaxed problem or at least somewhat as close to those, uh, uh, those kind of perfect, you know, so, or those toy exercises as possible. Can we find something that gets us close to the linear assignment problem or the connect four problem, right? Uh, or the in queen or the chips challenge problem. If you can, awesome, right? Because you, that solves a, giant percentage of your problem. Uh, but it is, in fact, difficult. And yes, uh, when you do, right? I, 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 I'm saying these things like, uh, I'm, I'm presenting them because I, if I knew them, I would be doing that, not teaching. I'd just have robot butlers everywhere, right? You all would too. I know it. I know. It. We're all waiting for the robot butlers. My point being is, okay, we're going to look at why when we attempt to do planning in some of the other approaches, there are limitations, right? Oh, well, when we were doing something like a star, right, I had a starting state, I had an ending state, I had my set of actionable moves that I could work towards. But the problem is, as we start to kind of think about things from that not observable environment, right, now maybe it's partially observable or completely unobservable. I don't know things. I know what my goal is, right? In this case, it's like, oh, I need to be at some location. But what happens if I don't even know where I'm starting out from, right? Or I don't know where the goal location is relative to where I am, right? That's, that's where I want you to kind of frame this. Like, oh, you know, in that situation, how do I start to tackle this problem? Well, one way is to start assuming I'm starting from every possible location, right? Or I'm, I'm assuming from all these possible different variations of locations. Is there one of them that I am and I get to the goal from? Again, this is that Dr. Strange analogy that I was working off of. It was just like, can I find a configuration that worked? Because as I'm starting to map through them, right, what I'm saying here is like, okay, well, let's just assume... You know, oh, it's somewhere on the bottom. I don't know which one it is, but let's just assume he, our, our, our agent is starting from this area, right? Well, then what? Well, same approach is happening. What you're doing is as you sort of run through your search to try and find things, you're looking at every single one of your potential actions. Now, technically, uh, south, oh yeah, south, you can't go south from the bottom, right? But right, what happens in each one of those actions? A different location is occurring, right? If I'm at I or J or K or L and I make the move up action, what changes in every single version of my problem? Well, in some of them, 
I would be moving forward. I'd be moving up. My situation would be changing. Some of them, I would not be. If I moved west, same thing, right? Now it's, well, technically I'm no longer, you know, I, I am finding a way to condense this down. That might be a benefit, right? Oh, I have four possible variables. Can I condense them back down into a single variable, right? That may be a benefit to you. May not also if you have additional forks in the road. Again, that's, that's now you're starting to get into multi-agent kind of ant colony stuff. Uh, and the same thing if we move to the east. So the big issue here is this doesn't really solve the problem. It's just like it made it harder because now it's no longer just brute forcing one agent, but since I have to represent that same agent across multiple situations, right, now I'm just, you know, dealing with more of the same problem, right? I didn't solve it. I didn't make it more efficient. I just said, oh, let's throw more agents at the problem, which is a solution. Again, ant colony was that. Genetic algorithms was that. You know, a lot of those biologically inspired heuristics that's what they're doing. Uh, so what about logic? Okay, well, can I just represent this problem as a logic problem? Well, I could, you know, or at least to start. And this is pure logic. We'll start with just pure logic. And that's a big issue as well. Because think about it from just the truth table perspective, right? Every possible configuration that I would have to be looking for, right? I'm trying to find a satisfactory, right? That's the P versus NP problem, trying to identify a satisfactory configuration or set of actions that my agent could be doing that would ultimately roll, you know, result in agent at goal condition, right? Well, the problem is, just like we saw, what happens if I add another action, right? If I add one more action, this goes from one, two, three, four, five, six. That goes two to the seventh power, right? Or is that two to the two to the sixth power, right? Sixty-five thousand, I think, is uh, that number off the top of my head. Quick, someone answer me. Two to the sixth power, go. Six. That's right. My point being is that's a big issue, right? That did not, that is, once again, we, the same problems that we talked about when we were in prepositional logic was a limitation. Oh, well, can we use first order logic? Well, it doesn't really, again, that's just first order logic. It's still true, false values. Proof by contradiction is still kind of difficult to shift into here. But there are some things about logic that were beneficial. There were things about the first order logic that was beneficial. And that's where we introduce big, fancy, like $5 words, once again, situation calculus. Now, when we think about calculus, you know, from a mathematical perspective, that's where we're starting to, oh, it's derivatives and curves and things like that. Calculus also gets used as a term in other worlds entirely. Right? Civil engineering uses calculus as a terminology for how we sort of make our connections and how we interact with the space. Right? We're, we're trying to manipulate the world. And we're going to be doing the same thing. We're, it's a big fancy $5 word, but you'll be happy to know not a single derivative will be made today. Right? No? Shucks. I mean, I can, I can do some if you'd like. They aren't going to be good, but... You know, uh, anyways, my point being is situation calculus, it is first order logic, but we add to it. Or we, we sort of use the rules of first order logic to establish our baseline, right? Our commands of this universe, our, our world, uh, if you will. And so we do kind of work through it because it allows us to represent that change that is going to be happening as we interact with the environment. That's, that's what we're kind of really looking for. So how do we start to kind of build this out, right? The start is essentially we're still building out that knowledge base. What's the world? You know, what are the rules to the world? What are sort of the requirements of certain actions? And then what are the effects of certain actions? Like what happens to our knowledge base if 
I do an action is how I want you to think about it. And then the game becomes, all right, well, can I get my initial state to my goal state through those actions, right? Again, it's things that you've seen elsewhere, but, right, we're still describing it uh, in a, a different context. So how does this start to come together? I, I sort of said it, right? It's a set of actions. But I also said, well, when I do an action, there's two sort of requirements for me to do an action. One, what are the preconditions? And notice it's terminology that's being formed here. It's a set of logic statements. I need a certain set of logic statements to be true in order for me to do a thing. I'm trying to find an example here. Um, okay, if I'm hungry, right? Uh, or uh, so, let me, I want to eat. I want to eat a sandwich. Okay, we're all good. You all had lunch, so sandwich. I'm not ruining your good. So I want to. I, I want to eat a sandwich. Well, what would be a precondition? For this, well, I probably need to be hungry. I need to probably be holding a sandwich, right? To eat a sandwich, I have to hold the sandwich. Uh, and I'm trying to think of, uh, okay, hold it and hungry, right? Those are my precon. Now, what's the results of me eating a sandwich? Well, I'm no longer hungry, in theory, right? And I'm no longer holding a sandwich, right? It's my tum tum going on. And so that's where we're kind of looking at this. And so you can start to see, well, how we frame this is that we have some action that we reference in a predicate form. And we also have its parameters or, again, the terms that we're using off of this that we can substitute or things of that nature, right? So if we look at it from a variable perspective, now, you know, this is the uh, uh, easier kind of example to work off of. What if I wanted to fly, right? Let's arbitrarily, because I'm flying out tomorrow, I got to go from R to U. To Memphis, right? Now, again, if we're thinking about this whole process, right? We got to start thinking about the knowledge base. Well, one of the things that I would need to do if I wanted to, you know, fly, there needs to be some plane. I'm who am I flying? I think I'm flying American Airlines, right? So that plane, I don't know the plane number. American Airlines one two three, right? Okay, there, that's the plane. Now specifically. I want to fly from the RDU airport to the Memphis airport. Now, let's look at what I just did there. I created substitutions. P is now being replaced with AM Air 123. From is being replaced with RDU. And Mem or to is being replaced with Memphis. Well, notice... My preconditions, those are also first order logic statements. It's a combination of them. Notice they're conjoined, they're connected with that conjunctive normal form, right? Oh, these things need to be true for my preconditions. Precon, right? Oh, well, I need that airplane to be at. Are to you, and I also need that thing, that term, to be a plane. Good, good so far. Good. I know the mood lighting is ruining the energy. I apologize. Assume I'm my my normal energetic self without mood lighting. So. Again, that keeps on going. Oh, that needs to be a plane. RDU needs to be an airport. Two needs to be an airport. These are rules that need to be applied. And what would happen 
Well, again, if that was my precondition, these all need to be true statements in the knowledge base, what would be sort of retracted or asserted into the knowledge base? Remember that example I gave of in prologue where, oh, you know, I can do an action. Let me assert something in prologue uh, or retract a fact in the prologue. That's where this effect comes into play, right? Oh, you're at... Sorry, that, I will fix that. That should say, I'm no longer at, apologize, but I'm no longer at, or that plane is no longer at that from location. A mare air, one, two, three, is no longer at RDU, and a mare air, one, two, three, is at Memphis. So these actions will start to kind of come together. Now that's where I'm going to present you with a little bit of a little brain twist for you. Now, I would like you to generate your own action. Specifically, I'd like you to generate a move action where you're moving a block X or or sorry, you're moving a block that it may potentially be on a, another block or on a table to some block Z. Just because technically a table can be cleared, you know, you, you can, this is Tower of Hanoi almost, right? You know, I can't, I can't theoretically pick up the green marker right now. There you go. Everyone can see the green marker. If you can't, imagine a green marker, right? I can't pick it up because it's 500 pound weights on there. I have to remove the 500 pound weight before I can move the next one over, right? So in that kind of context, I have given you another one of moving something to the table. Right? Rules slightly the same, slightly different. Notice I don't want you to be asking, you know, telling me that O, X, Y, and Z need to be blocks. I'd like the movement process. Here is your knowledge base or your states of all the terms that you can be working off of. Uh, let's see, I'll give you... I'll give you till 3.35. We'll come back at And we are back. So rather than leave, you know, before I jump into looking at y'all, what kind of rules, what, what are some preconditions that I would need to have? X needs to be clear, right? Again, if I look at my green here, you know, using this as my example, I cannot lift X. I cannot lift green because green, right, is not clear right now. So, right, precondition that X needs to be clear. Does anything else need to be clear? Z, right? Z also needs to be clear for the same kind of purpose, right? I can't, doesn't matter. If I, like if I can't move green to Z or I cannot move green to black because right, that, it doesn't work. Doesn't matter what I, what I end up doing. I can move red to the table. That, move this, I can't, I can't do that. I, mean, I can't shoehorn it in either. So any other rules? Self moves. Hmm? self moves, what do you mean by self? Not in the preconditions, right? We're not, it's no rule, no moves have to be done here. It is what, what needs to be true about our world in this case. 
Huh? X has to be on Y, yeah. Uh, that, again, if you kind of look at it, that's sort of being said here, right? Uh, it, it, it was in English, but X needs to be on Y. Now, what else could uh, be floating about? X can't equal Z. I can't move green to green, right? I can't move a lot of these, and so I'm, oh, I gotta. Uh, let's see, X, what am I doing here? I just wanna make sure I'm following the same logic, or not logic, but uh, okay, I am using the bang style. Uh, and that's why exactly I did that. I'll go ahead and say it as well, you know. These all have to be unique to each other going in there, right? So I can't move uh, X to Y if they're the same thing, or I can't move, uh, you know, uh, this thing that Y happens to be going on there. And yeah, and then we get into sort of the effects section. So this is more I'll just kind of just speed through things a little bit more, right? As we're looking at this, right, the effects going on there. Well, again, right, certain actions had to be, you know, again, it's not that I'm making these moves happen, but for me to make sort of my, my effect, if you will, right, if I were to move green to black, well, that would mean Z is no longer clear, right? Now, this is also, this is why we kind of present that idea of specifically kind of the difference between move to table and just a general move. Because, you know, right now, if I'm just moving blocks, well, Y may not be cleared anymore. Or, you know, I'm trying to think about this one in my head. Uh, okay, let me, let me remember what was going on here. Okay, so... If we're looking at this structure, move, uh, well, Y would be table, right? So table, so I don't want to immediately say Y becomes not clear, right, or, or clear in this case because you notice, right, if I move the table, I don't want the table to now no longer be allowed to be clear, right? I'd still want to be able to move things from a thing to another thing. In fact, that, yeah, so if we're looking at this, that's sort of what we're kind of talking about as the difference here. The effects, what are the effects? Well, Z is no longer clear. X is on. Z. And X is no longer on Y. So it's very similar to the table style, but notice also this, this is more kind of like a, as a little hint. I'll, I'll try my best when it comes to the midterm because I'm going to get, you know it's going to be on, right? It's okay to use things that exist, right? Sometimes it's just like, you know, you don't explicitly have to always make it a variable. It can sometimes be a term uh, in your preconditions, right? That's more nitpicking, but I know that that was a pain point for students last semester. So I'm, that's more like I'm, I'm catching y'all ahead of time for it, a.k.a. you won't have any problems with that question on the midterm, right? Not a problem. All right. Anyways, so yeah, again, the idea here, notice it's a bunch of Boolean statements. And certain things become true and certain things become false as we're working through this. So this is what situation, yeah. The initial state and the precondition. So initial state is, here are, here's what the knowledge base is at the start. When we think about preconditions, the idea becomes this is what they are currently at this moment in time. So the way I want you to think about it is 
even though the this is where it's different than just for sort of logic or what we've seen so far. It, previously, all of our rules and our facts did not change. What if they were allowed to change as we do things in this kind of environment? Certain things now become false or, you know, things become toggled of true or false now. Does that help explain it? Yes, because, like, so just, just to work off of this one again, right? So my precondition, or sorry, my initial state is red is on top of green. Uh, green is not clear. Black is clear. Red is clear. So if I'm looking at this, there's two actions that I have. Move to table and move, right, with all the things. If I were to take red and do move to table or red to table. Well, if we look at sort of the precondition, first things first, can I do this? Well, red needs to be on. I got to fix. I apologize. These slides. Whenever I make slight changes, it breaks everything. There is a little not symbol there, but it, I know exactly what happened. It, so I use different fonts. I'm apologizing to you. I'm trying to explain what's going on. I have different fonts. I use something called Universe, which is nice and fancy, but also proprietary. It does not have the Unicode for the not symbol. Right? And so this is me just rambling for a second. It's there, but I have to convert it into consolas. Right? Mm -hmm. Look at you. You're right freaking there. No, you're not? Okay, well, I'll fix that. No, okay. Listen here. <laughs> no, I, I yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 sorry. I was just an idiot. I read my own problem wrong. I was, okay. <laughs> to move something to the table, so it's not move red to table, it's move red from green, or remove red from green. So, well, red needs to be on green for me to move it off of green, right? Then red needs to be clear. And red cannot equal green. All my preconditions are true, correct? It's the same kind of a... Uh, think Tower of Hanoi, uh, where it's that, that idea of you cannot move a, a thing if it has something on top of it. Yeah. So, like, I can't move red. Imagine this is 50 bajillion pounds, right? So, ah, uh, it, it, it's not clear. So I can move red to the table. I can move red from green to the table. So my initial state no longer is true. I'm now sort of in this, as I've done a single action, everything's different. So when it now comes to this, well, what's the next action I would be doing here? I'm no longer relying on my initial state. I'm relying on the state as it currently is. So things have changed. Yes, when you when you, just for everyone. Yes. So when you're building out your preconditions, you're not thinking about it so much as the initial state. You're, you're focusing solely on kind of what are the rules that you need for that particular action to be true. And we'll, so we'll see this in much more detail in just a second when I make your brains turn to goo uh, with terminology, right? So how this kind of pans out is we do have those special variables. One is the actions, right? The A that we've started to sort of play around with, but also you notice Situation, 
another way I want you to think about it, another term I want you to think about. State. You've seen state. That's, you know, that why are, we, why are they changing it? Well, I didn't invent situation calculus. I didn't build it. It's called that. I know, right? But, okay, well, it's just, okay, that state or that situation, and then I have my action functions, that same kind of concept you can see. Oh, grab uh, some object from some location. Grab a key from a certain location, if we're thinking of the chips challenge analogy. Then, oh, well, what if I do that action, whatever this whole thing is, representing it as an A, on a specific scene, situation, time step, however you want to frame it, right? That's going to give its own kind of new scene. And then you've also got some relational and functional things, so like the on clause or something being locked at a certain situation. Uh, and yeah, again, these are all more terminologies because what we're looking at is specifically trying to represent that logical world. What about the environment changes or does not change, right? Oh, a wall. Well, as I move through the environment, move through the environment, as I enact different actions on the environment, do certain rules change because those rules have a new state that they're in? Walls, right? A wall should remain a wall in perpetuity. It doesn't matter if I move, you know, again, if we're thinking about the analogy of moving or the table, right? The table should remain clear no matter what happens the entire time. Right? As I move through things, I shouldn't be able to, my rules should not break that, that concept that the table is, should not change table clear being true, or clear table being true. And so you can see, oh, you know, well, what's the results? And specifically, this is where we get into the planning algorithms, is, oh, well, what happens if I move, you know, what is the result of me moving north, you know, move up on a specific state, situation, right, time step? Oh, well, it results in a new environment, a new situation, right? That's where we kind of focus in on things. And then you can see we can also tangle uh, or uh, uh, ground our terms. Again, this is that idea of starting to go, oh, let's replace the variables with real terms. So the idea now, again, if we frame it, right, all I've done so far is shown you why what we were doing in the past doesn't quite work. Now, introducing this big fancy $5 word situation calculus, how does it help solve the problem, right? It does a good job of it, but the implementation process and representing the knowledge is the difficult part. So, oh, hey, you know, for my chip to get to the portal, there needs to exist some, some state where chip's at the portal, right? What's that state? Well, again, if we're starting to look at this, maybe I have some initial kind of state that I'm working off of. Chip is currently at tile uh, 8.7, and tile 8.4 is locked, and I need the blue key. And there's probably more things going on there that, you know, I'm just trying to give you the example. So what would be the execution? Well, the execution would be I need to focus on, well, what would be the result of getting to that portal? Like if I did the action of go to portal, whatever that action turns out to be, right? Oh, well, that was probably coming from its own separate scene. Not scene two in the sense of like, oh, it magically already knows these things, but like scene X, right? SX, uh, situation X, uh, or situation N, right? Situation K. There's some situation where if I did the go-to portal, I'm at the goal state. Well, again, then we're expanding on that. We're going, okay, well, what, what could S2, how would I get to S2? Well, S2 would be like, oh, well, it's the result of if you unlocked the door. Let's imagine that there's a door in front of the portal uh, in this case. I got to unlock that door, whatever that action happens to be. And it has its own scene or state or whatever we want to call it, right, that it came from. Well, what is that? Oh, well, maybe it's from 
Let me get the blue key. And that could be, oh, if I'm at my initial state, oh, and my first action was get blue key, right? And that just magically, let's assume that answers all the questions of changing things. Ta-da, I got the blue. <laughs> Excuse me. Ha! Anyone want to shake hands after this? That's how COVID happened. Anyways, my point being, okay, so I get that blue key. That results in some situation. Oh, well, from that situation, I can then unlock the door, and that produces its own situation because then I can maybe go to the portal, and that would release, or release, that would get me to that new goal condition. That's where we start to talk about this idea of the graph plan. Now, the graph plan not very efficient. We don't use it anymore. Um, not in a bad way. It's just more of like it was for its time the the state of art, right? At, in 1995, when we brought it, it was beating everything. Just like it was the the cool thing. If you saw, you know, the equivalent of like, oh, if something took 10 seconds to solve, it solved it in one second type of problems. Now, the reason why I present that is that's where a lot of the algorithms nowadays that are attempting to solve this problem, they can solve it faster or better than graph plan, but they are using graph plan essentially as the baseline for it. What is graph plan, you might be asking yourself. Graph plan is that you make a plan graph, right? So the entire idea is rather than attempting to branch and think of all the possible actions, Right? Oh, let me move, you know, let me, let me try every possible action and then explore every possible action, like that brute force thing. Rather than doing that, what we're going to focus in on is we're going to do a very similar approach. It, notice it's iterative deepening search, first off, right? Oh, I have a set number of actions, K actions that I'm allowed to do. Did I succeed? In my, my, my plan, after K actions, yes, cool, you're done, right? You found the solution. No, increment and repeat. So, okay, right? that is iterative, the dip, yeah, iterative deepening happening. But now we got to focus on building that planning graph. Okay, well, that has its own nightmare of sets going on here. But specifically, what we're going to be looking at, let me visualize it instead. Uh, uh, ah, okay, I won't visualize it quite yet, right? Okay, what we're going to end up doing, I just, I see where I'm on time. I want to make sure, get to the ending point, right? We start at essentially our starting point, our starting situation, and then we start to present it with all of our facts that we may have going on in our world. This is what we call the initial state, right? Then what we're essentially going to be asking is, what are all the possible actions that I can be doing based on my current known values? Again, I have a bunch of logical statements establishing true and false values. What, Based on that, which actions did I have that all the preconditions are successful right now, are true right now. At which point, what would be the effects if I were to do some action at this point, right? So just arbitrarily, like we say, oh, let me do this action. What happens to, what happens to this fact two in the next time step, the next state, the next situation after doing that action. So as we kind of build this out, let's imagine we had a very simple little approach. I have, I'm starting at a start location, a door is, uh, or a tile is locked, and I'm not holding the blue key. My goal is to get to the portal. So I've got to get the blue key. I've got the unlock statement, right? Okay, well, again, this is where I start listing off what my initial... What was my initial state? Well, I'm at the start. I'm not holding the blue key. That tile 8-4 is locked. Then what? 
Well, I look at what my possible actions are. Now, specifically, I only had really one action that was allowed in this case, the get blue key, right? Get blue key. Uh, I don't have the ability to do unlock because I'm not holding the blue key, right? So only one possible action is going on here. Now, you notice that I'm also sort of carrying over. This is what these kind of are indicating, this little line to this. This is indicating, well, let's assume that these states or these facts are carrying over across to the next scene, the next state, right? That, that again, the concept of like, oh, well, I'm not doing, you know, I'm not going to be changing the, the, the not holding blue key part. But this is where, it, again, is, it, it does start getting ugly, but it starts to kind of make things a little easier for us. What would happen, since this is the only action that would be true, what would be the result of my knowledge base if I were to do this? Now, you notice, oh, well, if I carry over things as well. So those things are being carried over. But then also, if I were to get these blue keys, right, certain things can no longer, right, I have contradictions going on here, right? I'm not holding the blue key. If I do nothing, uh, if I do get blue key, I'm holding the blue key. So suddenly I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hold true and false values at the same time. And so we also have persistent actions. But how you kind of take care of this is through what is known as a mutex link, right? This is, again, the algorithm's approach to solving this, right? Oh, you cannot have these two things happening at the same time, right? You, that's not allowed. So you, you remember that, right? Oh, you would have a contradiction. So something has, one of those actions cannot be happening at the same time. Now, the big thing about this, right? I'm not showing you the pseudocode for it. Yes, it, it kind of gets a little, little too nonsensical. Uh, not nonsensical. It, it's a little bit more than what I can give you in one day is where I'll frame it. But you repeat this entire process until goals, your goal set is done. And what I mean by goal set is you might notice that essentially we're going to be forming multiple goals. There is a goal state, but now since I have different actions and sort of different situations, and I'm sort of doing this backward kind of tracing approach, I may produce sub-goals. Certain things have to become true before I can move to that goal condition. So how would I frame this, right? This is why I brought up the chips challenge approach in the past. And here is my sort of suggestion. Uh, I don't know why. I'll give you the hint. Problem set six is somewhere down the line. So what do you do? Okay, well, what's my end goal? And first things first, I understand that I need to have a goal. My goal condition is get to the portal, right? Okay, fine, fair enough. Get to the portal, that's here. Now, what do I got to do? All right, well, you, you learned this. You've done this. It was called a star. I need to do pathfinding, right? I got to do pathfinding. But herein lies a slight dilemma, right? I told you that as you're doing this pathfinding, maybe as you're backtracking, because if there was no you know, barriers, you just walk to the goal. But what if there are barriers? Specifically, there's a door. As you retrace, oh, well, for me to be able to get through this door or unlock this door or do any of those types of things, there's a precondition. I have to collect all the keys, or not keys, I have to collect all the microchips, right? Oh, well, that means that I need to maintain my sub-goals. And what does that do? Well, now it's I got to maintain them. Think about that from, again, coding perspective. How do you maintain multiples of things? I had a goal, but now I have another goal. Well, that's a list. That's a collection going on there. And specifically, 
here's my recommendations, priority queue or a stack. Why? Well, stack, you can't get to the portal until you unlock that door. You can't unlock that door until you get all the microchips. So you notice how a stack would solve sort of that problem. Any new problem becomes your first problem. You only tackle whatever your newest problem is. The priority queue, which microchip do I get first? Right? Maybe uh, you know certain priority or your rules or your things change over time. Which one is the better one? Depends on your problem and what you're, how you're implementing it, right? But then now you notice, oh, that's the repeating process. What's my next sub goal, right? Oh, let me work only towards that one for now until I solve that one. And so, okay, fine. Let's start with our initial plan. My agent's job is to get to the portal. So I start to backtrack. But as I do that, I notice that I have that precondition, that rule suddenly. Oh, to open the portal door, two preconditions need to be made. Chips left need to be zero. And I need to be at a specific location. Again, if we're thinking about this from sort of some of this is things that are intuitive, but we have to build them to the machine so that it's intuitive to the machine. I can't unlock the door from here. I have to be up here to unlock the door, right? I have to be by the door to unlock the door. Ah, uh, well, suddenly, that's a new, to get, you know, to have this, uh, this prerequisite taken care of, to unlock this door, that became some new goals. Now, specifically for that, you know, for this example, that's multiple goals, right? It's not just one chip. And when I say collect all chips, like, how do you frame that? How do you build that? Do you build it as just one thing? Or do you present it as these are locations that I need to be going towards? In a tile-based kind of world, you can work off of locations. But you notice, oh, collect chip one, collect chip two. I didn't put all of them in there because I need space. But you notice what's happening. Every one of those becomes a new sub-goal. And if we're working off of a stack-based approach, chip one just became my new primary goal or my new focal point. I need to get chip one before I can get chip two, before I can get all the other chips, before I can get my agent to the portal. So let's arbitrarily say it's that one right there. Why? Because... I picked that one. OK, well, fine. That's the first task that we're working off of. That's the one that we have to kind of build up. So what do we do from here? Or before, I, what do I do? What do I need to do after I've established this is my new goal? Why? I don't know who said it, but why do I need to unlock the blue door? I can't get to the chip. Well, how do I know I can't get to the chip? There was a process I had to do before that I got a path find, right? Again, if this is my new goal, I got to determine my path. I got to figure out what was my path to get here. Because think about what you did with a star, right? Oh. I found a path that gets me there. Now I have to start backtracking. As I backtrack, I see the blue door. I have to get through the blue door before I can get this chip. And as a consequence, well, that blue door probably has its own preconditions that need to be established. I need to probably, to open blue door one, since you notice that there may be multiple of these types of things, to open that door specifically, well, I need to, once again, be at a specific location, and I need to be holding onto, or have in my inventory, if you're, you know, whatever, I need to have a blue key. Well, what's the effect afterwards? Well, I need to no longer be holding the blue key or remove the blue key, however you want to frame that. I need to unlock that door, whatever that turns into or, you know, effect changes to. Uh, and I need to establish some 
new location for myself. So if I unlock the blue key, I no longer have a blue key, and I'm right there. Okay, fine, fair enough. Then, right, well, I got to get a blue key. Notice that was one of the rules. I got to have a blue key. So suddenly, that became a goal. So I have to do my pathfinding again. Notice, are there any constraints for me to get this blue key? Or any kind of barriers for me getting this blue key? No. So I did my pathfinding. I found my goal. I backtracked. No, no issues. No new conditions or new constraints had to be applied. Awesome. So as a consequence, I can make that action. I'm perfectly allowed to make that action. So do so. Oh, now look where we're back. Collect that same key. We essentially are doing the same pathfinding again from our new location. Because remember, new location means that path is different. And so we are going to have to do that same retrace. But do we have any barriers as a consequence? Well, no. We have an action that we have to do. We have that unlocked door, but that's, we don't have any constraint or preconditions that we need to update or modify to do that, right? I can just unlock that door. Yeah? Say that again, or can you say it in a slightly different way? Can you reframe it? How are we still building the framework? Arbitrarily picking which objective we need to do. Oh, so the question is, how are we sort of managing that huge branching factor? Part of it is the branching factor is still big. Like, it's still big. It's just smaller than what it potentially could be. Um, but that's where... This is, don't think of this as, as a one-stop algorithmic solution. Notice that's why I'm not really giving you pseudocode. There is a, like parts of it that you're also building for your environment solely. Like that's, this is the hard part. This is why like we don't have robot butlers yet, right? If you just sit a robot butler in this environment versus another classroom, completely different environment. So everything breaks because it was built and trained solely for here, right? Same thing will happen. Like your model is understanding that these things are in the positions that they are, or th this is how the world works. The second you strip it and put it into another model, um, we call that transferring models. That is actually active research as well. Can I teach a model in one area or teach an agent in one area and put it into another? How well does it perform then? Uh, Dr. Barnes and Chi, Dr. Tiffany Barnes, Dr. Min Chi here at NC State, that's one of their research projects right now. Can we train uh, a tutoring model using deep thought and then use that exact same model for Pyrenees? So deep thought was logic, proof by contradiction. Pyrenees is teaching you probability. Can we house the performance in it? That's, yeah, so we got to do a little bit. We, there is a little bit of we're still involved, human in the loop. We're still involved with this process right now. It is not perfectly automated. Still only got four minutes. So again, we collect that chip, right? Oh, I, 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 I'm noticing that, oh, that chip is gone. Or, or sorry, I, I collect that chip, which means that I can remove it from my goal conditions. And then it's repeat, rinse, and repeat. Now, I already, you know, I've already kind of given you the warning, but I'll go ahead and give you the warning again. I know you're still worrying about problem set four, I've already warned you about what problem set five kind of is going to be like. This is your problem set six. You essentially have to build an agent that solves Chip's challenge. Aren't you excited? Terrified? I'm stalling for time. Questions?
Well, it was great seeing you. I hope you enjoyed your break. I hope you're welcome back. Make sure Problem Set 4 is done by Monday. And I'll see you Monday. Take care.